Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest School of Humanities lecture. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Natalia Supra. And Natalia's going to talk about offensive jokes in antiquity. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to talk about this uh, because this is a topic that has been in my mind for some time now. So I work on ancient comedy mostly, but lately my most recent project is on honor, shame and disease in antiquity. And part of it has to do with mockery against the disease. So this is how this relates a little bit to what I'm doing now. And hopefully I would like to work more extensively on this uh, and on the idea of political correctness or incorrectness in antiquity. So this is a work in progress, pretty much. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about sick and rape jokes in antiquity, specific case studies. And when I say sick, more specifically, I'm going to be talking about mental illness and madness, so not so much physical illness. Uh, and on the limits of function of humor in antiquity and now, so to what extent are uh, the social cultures and norms and values influence the way we joke about things, and in turn how humor is informed uh, by society at the same time, then and now. Uh, and then as I said, uh, the idea of political correctness or incorrectness in antiquity. So was there an idea that certain jokes were offensive in antiquity and people shouldn't use them uh, as we do now, or there was no such thing? Um, and in fact, I will start with the idea of political correctness, uh, which is a very interesting concept. It's very prevalent nowadays. And uh, interestingly, it originated in the late 1960s uh, and on the left, so politically correct was a term used, um, was a term of approval and was an approving phrase that was used by the Leninist left to denote someone who told the party line. So it was first an approving term, then it became ironic and satiric, and it was a reminder that something that was politically desirable on the grand scale was not always immediately expedient in day-to-day -day living. So how did this concept arise? There is a, um, a certain philosophy behind it and um, which we can define as a sort of new postmodern ideology. Uh, and this ideology was informed uh, by the Paris 1968 philosophy and it was infused with cultural and identity politics. Um, so the idea that in cultural affairs, the single most important way to classify people is by race, ethnicity and gender. So from Derrida and from the 1968 philosophy came the idea that language and literature are vast impersonal structures that determine the nature of society. Also from Derrida and the linguists, um, we have the idea that um, words in language should be defined by means of their difference with each other. So from that idea came the idea of defining people in the same way by means of their difference with each other. So offering this crucial analogy between identity politics and linguistic analysis. And then we've got various other ideas in the mix, like uh, from Foucault, the idea of looking at culture as a field for struggle for achieving political power, uh, the interest in marginalized groups as well, and from Marxism, the idea of uh, an impending beneficial social change. Um, so put all these in the mix and we've got the idea that cultural language are the giant hidden impersonal structures that permeate life and they themselves are reflections of various social groups uh, which are defined again by race, gender and sexual orientation. And all these different cultures are engaged in a struggle for power and um, the current idea is that the culture of white heterosexual males is a culture of domination. So how does political correctness fit into this? So if language has such a big effect on our life, if it's this big impersonal structure that basically defines our society, then by changing language, we might be able to change culture. So by controlling language, we might be able to have an effect on how people think about culture. Uh, so by teaching everyone to appreciate the culture of all groups in equal measure and by discouraging the use of certain common phrases that convey racial and gender hierarchies, uh, there is a hope that the domination of this one small group will come to an end. 
Uh, so in abandoning the idea of any cultural center at all, we will uh, create a more egalitarian society. Uh, now that's a very nice idea, but it has been criticized rightly in many ways uh, from a number of people from a number of uh, sides. So it's been criticized both by the right and by the left. Um, so the first quote is by a conservative journalist uh, who basically says that uh, political correctness is a system of left-wing ideological repression. So it's a, a sort of a thought police. But it's been criticized by the left as well uh, so commentators on the political left contend that conservatives use the concept of political correctness to downplay and divert attention for substantively discriminatory behavior against disadvantaged groups on the one hand, but also on the other hand, it has gone to a, an extreme. Uh, so basically there is a sort of self-righteousness in people who, who dictate how other people should talk and behave. And there I put um, a quote from Terry Eagleton as well, who says that uh, a this is a self-righteous fetishism of language, which is no more than a symptom of political frustration. Uh, so you've got a number of criticism from, uh, criticisms from various sides. And of course, political correctness is a very important concept when it comes to comedy. Uh, because if there is an idea that we should avoid certain phrases or words, then this has an effect on how we joke about things and what we should or we shouldn't be joking about. Um, and a number of comedians nowadays have been increasingly complaining about this dictatorship, as they call it, of political correctness, which uh, puts a stop to uh, the jokes they want to, to um, throw to the public. Um, and I've, I've put a short clip there from South Park. How many of you like South Park? Okay, good, because I love South Park. This entire presentation could just consist of South Park, literally. Uh, so this is a very short clip uh, because I thought it was funny. And it is, um, so it's at a certain point late in the series, season 19, I think, uh, the principal that is in charge of the school is the PC principal, so the politically correct principal. And then he gets together with the vice principal, who is a very strong independent woman, and they have the so-called politically correct children. So this plays uh, with the idea, obviously, that uh, political correctness is, in a sense, an oversensitivity, and people get offended for a number of things that they shouldn't be offended about. But at the same time, uh, it shows how certain subjects are sensitive to humor. So basically, you can look at it from various sides. Uh, well, we all want the president out of here. It's just a matter of how we do it. We don't need more of South Park. <laughs> Maybe later. OK. Um, so, to resume, uh, here are a few quotes uh, from, uh, well, a quote from a US comedian, George Carlin, uh, who was basically criticized for being very um, abrasive in his humor. Um, and he's also criticizing uh, political correctness. And he says that, what is important is the intention behind the words that makes them good or bad. The words are completely neutral. The words are innocent. And I think this is very debatable. I can see what he's saying, but I think this is very debatable. At the same time, we have uh, John Cleese from here, uh, who is uh, also criticizing political correctness. And he says that it, it starts, it begins as a decent idea, but then at some point it goes completely wrong. And uh, it's taken to an extreme, to an absurd when he says, make jokes about Swedes and Germans and French and English and Canadians and Americans. Why can't we make jokes about Mexicans? Is it because they're so feeble that they can look after themselves? It's very, very condescending there. Which is true again to a certain extent, but of course one has to take into account um, the intention behind the joke, the context in which the joke is made, and uh, the place also, geographically even, uh, in which the jokes are made. But there you go, just uh, to summarize a little bit the debate there. And moving on to um, the meat of the talk, uh, which has to do with the function of politically incorrect humor, if we can uh, define it in this way, and sick jokes. Um, 
So these are a number of theories which explain why we laugh. And you might agree that if we try to explain how we laugh, then the joke isn't funny anymore, but we're going to do it a little bit here. Um, so most of the jokes which refer to the disease, in antiquity specifically, have been associated with what we call superiority humor. So it's supposed to be, we are supposed to feel superior because of the infirmities and the inabilities of the other person and this is why we make fun of them and we laugh at them essentially. So not just with them but we ridicule and we mock them. Um, and to a certain extent this is true. So when it comes to physical illness in antiquity, the superiority humor is definitely there. But what I want to show today is that we can maybe have another function of humor when it comes to cases of mental illness. And this is something that comes closer to these categories. Um, so the laughter as a sign of the release of nervous energy. So when we talk, for instance, about death, it's because we feel awkward about it and we have the surplus of energy that we want to get rid of. Um, Laughter of absurdity, so when something is uh, incongruous, we laugh at the incongruity between, for instance, the patient's reality and our own reality when it comes to madness. And I would like to show that um, certain cases of laughter with madness in antiquity display what um, Ionesco has described as a comic improbability about the unendurable absurdity of existence or what Beckett has described as a risus purus, so pure laughter. So basically when we laugh at ourselves and at others, but also at ourselves at the same time, in distressing and unhappy situations, and this represents an effort to laugh in a world that continually turns absurd. Um, so the latter category is something that has to do with most with contemporary ideas about the disease. I won't talk about it now, but feel free to ask me about it later. Um, okay, so um, what, I want, what I wish to argue is that madness can be more comic than tragic because often, uh, in Greek drama especially, madness is associated with tragic texts and of course it's something tragic and of course it makes sense to be the material of tragedy but madness very, very often also crops up in comedy uh, and normally the way we see the relationship between the two texts is we view comedy through tragedy but I want to say that maybe we can uh, we can um, turn uh, the balance there and view tragedy through comedy. So how madness can be inherently comic. Uh, and if indeed we can laugh with madness, what sort of madness is the one that is evoked? Just what I mentioned before about uh, the laughter of absurdity. Um, so in Aristophanes, in Aristophanic comedy, we have a number of cases of madness. So basically the, the idea in most of the plays is that the comic hero comes up with this really big, crazy, um, uh, surreal idea. Uh, and this is how the accusation of madness is always connected with him. So he's so crazy as to come up with such a crazy plan. In Aristophanes' piece, for instance, the comic hero comes up with the idea uh, to feed a giant dog beetle and ride it and go up to the sky and find Zeus and complain <coughs> to him about the current situation of war in Athens uh, and bring back peace, essentially. And of course, every time the comic hero succeeds. Um, so at the beginning of the play, we have the servants who, who need uh, the dough for the dung beetle to eat, which is basically crap. Uh, so they complain at the same time and um, they complain about their master who is crazy and he is heard from behind the stage uh, to, to swear at Zeus and you know to shout and cry and act a little bit crazy. So they are saying you're hearing the typical symptoms of his delusions. I'll tell you what he said when the bile first came over him. Then they describe his intentions and then when Trigeus comes on stage there must have been this giant uh, machinery through which he was brought hovering on stage and he was thrusting about quite a lot. Uh, so the slave says, "Ah, oh, Master Lord, you're so deranged. Be quiet, be quiet. Well, why are you vainly beating the air? I'm flying for the sake of all Greeks, trying my hand at a novel adventure. Why do you fly? Why act crazy for nothing? 
So what I want to, to argue in this case is that what makes Madness comic is a visual spectacle and comic violence uh, has a lot of affinities with madness. So when mad people are in a bout of, in a fit of madness, they become violent. And this, uh, as I said, has comic affinities with slapstick comedy and how comedy is, uh, comic violence is portrayed on stage. So violence and aggressiveness as byproducts of insanity can fit right into comedy's uh, slapstick routine. And it is very interesting the fact that in cases where we have such as this, when we have, um, in cases of madness in comedy, we have all the performance and the representation of madness on stage. So we've got the full repertoire, if you want. Uh, the delusions, the, uh, the thrusting about, uh, the foaming. We don't have that in tragedy. So in tragedy, all cases of madness and all the bouts of delirium are always reported and they are never manifested on stage. And of course, this might have to do with the convention that all tragic events happen off stage. But at the same time, it might have to do with the fact that if they were shown on stage, they would be funny. And this is why this was avoided. Um, so for instance, in a tragic example, Sophocles' Ajax, uh, Ajax is driven mad by Athena and he's led in his delusions to, to, to slaughter basically a number of sheep thinking it was uh, his fellow soldiers. Um, so there is almost an obsessive attentiveness to not showing Ajax when he's mad on stage. Um, so after we hear, after we hear about his uh, fit of madness, um, the, from uh, reported to us on stage, um, and before Ajax comes out, it is made sure that Ajax is sane before he comes out. So the chorus says, the man seems to be sane, come open the door, perhaps the sight of me will make him feel some shame. And take Misa, his concubine, look, I'm opening the door and you can see what he has done in his own condition. So we are assured before he comes on stage that he is indeed in his right mind. Uh, and the only case where he is shown on stage while he is deluded is the beginning of the play and his dialogue with Athena. But even then, he's just delusional, so he's not violent, he's not, he doesn't have any of the, of the physical symptoms of madness, just the mental ones. Um, and when he goes off to complete his task, his deed, uh, he goes off stage to do that, so we don't see any of the actual uh, physical symptoms. Um, but this passage is interesting for another reason, because we have here two contrasting attitudes to madness. So we have Athena, who suggests to Odysseus, who was a contestant for the arms of Achilles and was, uh, in a way, Ajax's enemy. Uh, so she is suggesting to Odysseus that he should laugh at Ajax's madness, and Odysseus refuses to laugh with it. Uh, and he's saying, I pity him in his misery, though he's my enemy, because he's bound fast by a cruel affliction, not thinking of his fate, but my own. So this goes back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, most people have said that, um, um, so the laughter of Athena represents the higher distance level of the gods, but it might be suggested to the audience to laugh uh, with Ajax, but I think a mediating approach is possible here. So instead of choosing pity or mockery, uh, pure laughter before the absurdity of the human condition may be another viable response. And I think this is what Odysseus is suggesting because he says that he is moved by Ajax's misery because it is a reminder of his own and every mortal's predicament. So laughing with and not at madness may be a response to the helplessness of the human condition. And this may be another possibility which is uh, suggested to the audience. Um, okay, staying on the subject of um, visual humor and comic violence a little bit more, we actually have a case of um, representation of the full repertoire of madness when it comes to Ajax. And this comes from an author who, who writes much, much later on from Lucian. Uh, so this is supposed to be a defense on uh, of pantomime, well, defense, it depends to what extent you can take seriously, Lucian seriously in what he says uh, about this. But what we're interested in here is um, he's talking about a performer 
who was performing Ajax's Madness. And uh, this is what he says about the performance. So in presenting Ajax going mad immediately after his defeat, he so overleaped himself, that's the actor, that it might well have been thought that instead of feigning madness, he was himself insane. For he tore the clothes of one of the men that beat time with the iron shoe, and snatching a flute from one of their companies with a vigorous blow, he cracked the crown of Odysseus who was standing near and exulting in his victory. Indeed, if his watch cap had not offered resistance and borne the brunt of the blow, Poor Odysseus would have lost his life through falling in the way of a crazy dancer. So this is, as I said, the full uh, performance of Madness with all of the symptoms. But what is really interesting is that, well, Lucian, or the narrator, makes a distinction between the learned audience who thought that the performance was ridiculous because it was bad acting and he was over-exaggerating, going over the top, but he's saying that most of the audience who was not the learned audience actually enjoyed the performance and they found it quite funny. Not ridiculous, but funny. So the thing caused some to marvel, some to laugh, and some to suspect that perhaps in consequence of his overdone mimicry, he had fallen into the real ailment himself. And that refers to, as I said, the, the, the mass, the common audience. The pit, however, all went mad with Ajax, leaping and shouting and flinging up uh, their garments. Um, might be that um, the audience is laughing to the... Um, uh, not to the bad acting, not with the bad acting, but actually laughter may arise due to the realistic performance of madness and not because the actor was not good at what he was doing. At least it might be a possibility. We have a similar story in another author which has to do with Hercules. Um, and the actor again was trying to portray Hercules in his madness and he didn't keep to his dancing and then uh, the audience started laughing and then he stopped the performance, he broke character and he said, idiots, I'm dancing a madman. So again there the actor thought that the audience was laughing because they didn't understand what he was doing, but it might also be that the actors were actually laughing because this was genuinely funny, because it was absurd and um, because of the uh, visual humor. Okay. Um, staying on madness a little bit longer, we've got uh, an example which um, displays more clearly not so much the visual humor that I've been talking about so far, uh, but uh, the comicality of absurdi absurdity and incongruity that I mentioned to you at the beginning. Um, so we've got Euripides is Heracles, and again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the plot of the play, uh, Euripides is basically, well, he goes mad and he kills his wife and children. That's a short story. Um, and again, the madness is not shown, but is reported by a messenger on stage, and this is the speech of the messenger. So the first bit describes all his weird uh, behavior. When he was about to bring a torch in his right hand, uh, he suddenly stood uh, still in silence. The children turned their faces towards him in wonder and their father started tarding. His looks were utterly changed. His face was distorted with the agitation of his eyes. Blood red streaks appeared. Foam dripped onto his handsome beard. So note all these are related, not shown. Um, and then we've got the maniacal laughter. We've got a number of uh, absurd uh, gestures which culminate at him pretending to ride a chariot and goading invisible horses. And you get the point. Um, so we've got this description and then uh, the messenger goes on to say, to, to um, report the uh, response of the servants at all this, and he says the servants' feelings were torn between mirth and fear. And one of them, looking at his fellows, would say, is our master playing a game with us or is he insane? Um, so this is very important as a passage because it showcases a reaction to madness which involves laughter but not mockery. So the slaves find Heracles' behavior funny or amusing because it is absurd and because it completely defies any logical explanation. So his insanity is perceived as a game, is our master toying, playing a game with us, as if Heracles were putting on a performance and was pretending to be someone else. Um, 
So when he is in the grip of madness, Heracles moves in and out of the dramatic reality, which causes confusion, and this is the source of mirth in his eternal audience, which are the servants. Now, if the scene were enacted on stage, the confusion of the slaves would probably add to the amusement of the external audience. But as I said, it is not enacted just because uh, it would exactly have this comic effect. So there is a clash between the perception of the external audience who realize what the situation is and the aporia of the characters in the dramatic reality of the play. Um, for Heracles' case, we have a very interesting pictorial evidence, which is quite rare. Um, so this is a depiction of Heracles in his grip of madness. This is a vase, a pestan vase, a vase, sorry, by Asteas, uh, which has been associated with a theatrical stage um, so you can see Heracles in the center of the vase. Uh, he is carrying one of the children, I think. It's just one. Um, there you've got Tecmisa, who is uh, at a loss as what to do on the one side. On the other side, you've got a pile of things uh, which are supposed to be household uh, domestic furniture and utensils and are piled up and they are set on fire. So this is clearly the, mo the moment of madness for Heracles. Um, so his wife Megara, she flees with, uh, with horror um, and he's just about to burn the child as well. So we don't have the actual moment of uh, the tragic death, which of course would not be funny, but we have the moment right before. And this bus has divided scholars between those who believe it is a depiction of a straight tragedy, so they don't think this comes from um, a comic burlesque. They believe it was actually a tragic play. And those who view it as a local form of tragic comedy. Um, so there are uh, some absurd uh, elements there, like Heracles wears a very feminine dress uh, beneath his armor, as you can see. There, um, he has these ridiculous feathers on his helmet. And scholars have also noted, um, I wasn't that observant, but scholars have noted that uh, there is an absurd inclusion of non-flammable metal objects in the bonfire, um, which could have produced a comic effect. So Oliver Taplin is very quick to refute this view that this is a tragic comedy and maintains that these details are merely the result of Heracles' delusions and part of his macabre fantasy rather than a sign of comedy. But I think he completely misses the point because the point is these details are comic because they are part of Heracles' delusions. Um, so we don't have to give a definite answer to what is going on in the scene, but even the division in scholarship, I think, is telling. We are presenting with an instance in Heracles' madness, which oscillates between the horrific and the comic. So just before the tragic outcomes occur, we, like the slaves in Euripides' play, may hesitate between laughter and horror. Um, so this, is, uh, this was the first part the more extensive part uh, about uh, madness um, in tragedy and comedy and how madness can be inherently funny and what can it mean when we laugh with madness. And as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be superiority humor laughing at someone, but it can also be the pure laughter of absurdity uh, in the face of the helplessness of human condition and existence. Now, moving on to, to the second case of uh, politically incorrect humor, which has to do with sexual assault and rape. Um, now, I say rape, but this is slightly anachronistic because in antiquity we don't have a specific term which denotes rape. Um, so we obviously have cases of sex assault, but the way they're phrased is um, by the words bia or biasomai, so basically denoting force and not necessarily sexual force. Uh, so just a, a disclaimer that uh, rape is a little bit anachronistic. Um, and what has puzzled people quite a lot is that rape features is basically the main plot device uh, in what we call new and Roman comedy. Um, so all of the romantic plots in New and Roman comedy revolve basically around rape. It's everywhere, it's prevalent. Uh, and what is, uh, what is sad 
is that Ray basically becomes the staff of Romans. Um, so the plot normally revol revolves around uh, the rape of, um, of a girl by a young man uh, who was drunk or who was really young and reckless, uh, didn't know what he was doing. There were a number of mitigating circumstances, let's say, and he rapes the girl. And then uh, we have the happy, re the happy resolution uh, with the marriage of the rapist and the girl. Um, so as I said, this to us sounds hardly as a stuff of romance. Uh, but the main idea, and this is why I say it is sad, it's that the only way in which a scenario could be conceptualized, a scenario by which a citizen woman could be the subject and the object of erotic attention could only be that. So we've got basically the possibility, um, the danger of a woman appe uh, appearing um, um, attractive and um, uh, uh, arousing uh, feelings, uh, love in a young man, but the only thing in which this scenario could be enacted is through the rape of a young woman, because of course premarital sex was uh, not allowed. Uh, so the only way we can have romantic story is basically through a rape. Um, and we have a number of other subplot stories in which uh, the rape has taken place before the beginning of the plot. Um, so we've got a couple who is probably already married um, and the girl has been raped in the past um, and the child was abandoned, but then it is found, and there are complications arising because they don't know who the child is, but then it turns out miraculously uh, that the husband was also the rapist and everyone is happy. Um, so there has been a lot of discomfort with, uh, with the fact that rape is so prevalent in, uh, in a genre that we'll call comedy, and people have argued about how rape basically works as a motif, uh, as a way to show the coming of age of a young man, um, uh, so how he, he, he progresses from a state of being young and careless and um, uh, to a state of being a proper adult. Uh, but as I said, I don't think this is inherently problematic because even though rape is a part of the plot, it does not uh, become the object of humor. So rape is part of the comedy, but rape is not, we, we're not supposed to laugh at or laugh with the rape in the play. So it's just there as a plot device. So I would say that even more problematic is how rape is handled in old comedy and Aristophanes, because there we've got repeated cases of threatened sexual assault, granted, we never have an actual rape on stage. It is always uh, fantasized about or threatened. Uh, but there, we are supposed to laugh with uh, those cases. So their rape does become comic material. So what happens quite a lot in, uh, well, I say old comedy, but it's mostly Aristophanes that I have in mind. Uh, so what happens mo mostly in Aristophanes, at least I would say, six out of the 11 comedies, is that the victory of the comic hero, the triumph of the comic hero, his ascent to power, his rejuvenation, which normally coincide also with the conclusion of peace. So all of these are equated with sexual aggression. Um, so as the hero gains potency, as he becomes more powerful, he also gains sexual potency. And we see this with repeated uh, threats for rape across a number of plays. Um, and of course, it's very, very common for the comedies of Aristophanes to end um, with uh, young women on stage. We don't know if they were nude, we don't know if they were actually portrayed by women or not. Nevertheless, uh, young girls, young women on stage who stand as personifications of abstract concepts like reconciliation or like peace or like um, harvest and holiday. Uh, and these are sexually manipulated by the comic uh, hero. Um, so for instance, just a very short example from uh, Peace, the play that I mentioned to you at the beginning. Um, so the hero comes back from his quest at the heavens to find Jews. He comes back victorious. He brings peace back to the world. 
and everyone is rejoicing and celebrated in this uh, newfound peace with uh, a lot of sexual energy, let's say. Uh, so along with peace, he brings back um, this young lady who, whose name is Opora, normally translated as summer or holiday. And so this young lady is given to the councillors to have their way with her. Uh, and we see here, councillors, chairman, behold holy day, look what good times I've brought to give you. You can lift your legs in the air right away and have a liberation feast. Just look at this cooker of hairs. Now that you have here, you're free to hold a fine sporting competition first thing tomorrow. You can wrestle hair to the ground, stand here on all fours, oil up for the pancreation, and like young lads bang and gouge with fist and prick alike. And then we have the chorus who, who shout in chorus, what shall we do to hair? What shall we do to hair? We will rip hair, we will rip hair. Of course, you can see all the metaphors there, and the Dougal and Andrews. So uh, everyone is supposed, this becomes not just a private fantasy, but a collective male fantasy, and everyone is supposed to rejoice in the uh, success of the hero. So the aggressive sex becomes synonymous with claiming and establishing power. Um, and of course, as I said, the rapes are never actually, never actually materialized on stage. Of course, we have no idea what would be happening on stage when these were uttered. So maybe the, the girl was passed on from one to another and for sure indecent gestures would take place. Uh, so even though the act is not happening on stage and the rape is imagined, at the same time it reflects and reinforces the realities of power dynamics which were inherent in the gender and social roles in the city at the time. Um, so, is it funny? That's always the awkward question. Was it funny? Is it funny now? Was it funny in a different way then than it is now? Um, one of the most, so Halliwell, who's written this huge book on laughter and written a lot on comedy, he's arguing that basically the humorous effect we have with these cases and other cases of uh, outright shamelessness and Aristophanes come from the suspension of rules. So the idea of the carnival and um, the overturn of the rules or the suspension of normal rules. And he says that basically the audience would be or the spectators would be able to laugh uh, because this is something, this is a behavior that they would normally condemn and they would be ashamed of, uh, but they are invited to take strong unabased pleasure in the dramatic representation of laughable behavior of a kind they would be ashamed to engage in society. So comedy works as a sort of institutionalized shamelessness, which I think to a great extent is true, and of course we're not arguing that people in antiquity would just go around you know, raping uh, women. This was not obviously the case. And we've got very safe indications um, from new comedy, nonetheless, that rape was something that was, um, that had a very damaging effect to the psyche of the woman as well. And of course, was not something that was encouraged. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's very easy. I think this is a very neat idea, if you want. So you don't just go into the theater and then immediately you switch off and you say, right, now I'm in a safe space. Now I'm in this um, safe, institutionalized uh, environment where I can laugh with, the, with things that I would normally not laugh. I don't think there is a sort of, um, I don't think there is a such a, a clear separation between the two. Uh, so I think Halliwell is maybe exaggerating a little bit there. Um, and I think part of what these, uh, part of what would make these scenes humorous was um, uh, the contemporary ideas about gender and sex relationships in, uh, in the city. Um, okay, we can talk about it in the discussion as well, if you want. Moving on a little bit to... This vase, so um, this is the famous Yuri Medon vase. Um, so this is a different case. This is basically a rape of a man, uh, not of a woman. But I'm following the thread that I began with um, rape as a metaphor. So in old comedy, we have rape as a metaphor for power um, uh, and ascent to power. 
And here we have a similar idea, rape as a metaphor for a very similar thing. Um, so what we have here is, um, there is an inscription, but it's not visible here and you cannot read it. Um, so one part of the inscription says, I'm Yuri Maidon, and the other bit says, so these are the two sides of the vase. The other bit says, I'm uh, standing bent. And again, this has, uh, this has created controversy among scholarship as to what exactly is happening on this stage. So the most prevalent, uh, on this, sorry, Vaz, uh, the most prevalent idea um, is that basically we have here a sort of visualization, or if you want, literalization of uh, a metaphor which refers to the Battle of Eurymedon. So this is supposed to be a Greek person, this is supposed to be a person um, soldier and uh, this is the way of the Greeks to show that they conquered the Persians. And as Dover translates the inscription, it could be translated as we've baggered the Persians. So the Greeks were victorious in the Battle of Eurymedon. Uh, this nice lad there is Eurymedon and he's about to rape the Persian soldier. And you can see how he is basically holding his penis as if it were a weapon and he doesn't carry any other weapons. Whereas a person soldier is, um, it's been disputed whereas he is person or Scythian because some people think he's Scythian, but that's a very long story. Uh, so he's standing bent and he's waiting for the anal penetration to occur in a way. Um, so this is um, a personification of the battle and in the pursuit is a battle, then the rape is a victory, and this is the metaphor conveyed here. Um, so, I think I have some time to talk about this because this is really interesting. Uh, uh, people have speculated about the gesture that um, the person is doing, uh, and most of the theories have to do with this is a gesture of surrender, this is a gesture of surprise or alarm, or fear, um, and I thought that was very um, that was very strange because the first thing that came to my mind when I saw this was that basically this looks exactly like the mocking gesture we make, you know, when we want to make fun of someone. So to me, it looks like this person is is mocking, but whom is it mocking and why? Um, so it could be that. Um, uh, it could be that the painter wanted to, to portray the, I don't know, the arrogance uh, of the enemy and how basically they are punished for this arrogance. So this is what the mockery has to do with. Uh, this is how the mockery is relevant. Um, so are we invited to mock the foreigner and identify with the pursuer? Or maybe the mockery in this, um, so the mocking in this case becomes the mocked through the rape. Or uh, are we maybe supposed to think uh, that this person is mocking the spectator, the audience at the same time, and what could this mean? Uh, I'm not sure how to think about that. I just thought it was very interesting that this gesture, at least in all of the items of scholarship that I, I consulted, no one has come up with the idea that it's supposed to be mocking. So. Um, the most recent idea is that it has to do with, uh, so the way this is painted, it's supposed to do with uh, how the person is placed up against the vase's wall. So he is basically portrayed as if leaning against the, the wall of the vase. Um, and this uh, would be more funny when uh, the wine was drained from the vase and it would be even more conspicuous how he leaned against the wall. Anyway, this is one of the theories. Um, so, as I said here, rape becomes as a metaphor for uh, a battle and a victory and a fitting punishment maybe for uh, the enemy who mocks uh, the Greeks. And for sure, um, for sure a lot of the Greeks would uh, have a sense of manly superiority, obviously, when they were uh, watching this vase and this was probably something that would be passed around at the symposium and people would, would laugh about this. Um, so both the cases of comedy that I mentioned to you before and this vase display fascination with domination by means of sex. 
So while humor is based on the, in both cases, on the literalization of a metaphor, for the joke to be effective, the sense of a manly superiority must be at work. So the use of the humor in these cases reveals an underlying logic of dominant patriarchal framing. And of course, ancient societies were much more desensitized, less solicitous about oppressed groups, and this somehow must have played into the social perceptions and their attitudes towards the comic. So humor in these cases is informed by the fallicism of the society, and in turn, humor reinforces a hegemonic, androcentric ideology, and perhaps perpetuation of aggression uh, against oppressed groups. So, what happens in our case? So in, in a post-civil rights era, where gender discrimination and sexual violence have become socially unacceptable, and steps are taken to raise awareness about the pervasiveness of sexual violence and the dangers of toxic masculinity, perhaps laughter has a different function there. Um, so perhaps there is space for such humor to, to breach norms uh, or taboos around offensive gender discourse, thus making sexist humor socially cathartic. So perhaps we do laugh in a very different way with uh, things like that. At the same time, we live in very strange times. So the examples I cited from antiquity showed how a metaphorical system of rape was applied to explain and validate fantasies of male omnipo omnipotency and international politics. At our times, we witness the literalization of such metaphors. Ask me about this at the end, because I don't have the time to talk about this. Uh, so at our times, we witness the literalization of such metaphors. The way politics are conducted is not just likened to rape and sexual aggression, but often is, in fact, equated with rape and sexual aggression. So in the 1990, the former US President George Bush justified the decision to invade Iraq by repeatedly characterizing the occupation of Kuwait by Iraq as rape, not metaphorical, but literal rape. Which, of course, begs the question in what way the Iraq invasion by the US was different. And of course, in more recent times, we have seen examples of political discourse such as this. Uh, which are deemed to be acceptable and even suggested models of conservative toxic masculinity, or cases such as this. So with this in mind, I would like to think that our enjoyment with instances of rape or sexist humor meets the pain of recognizing that such laughter signifies a frequent failure of civilized society to live up to its professed values of equality and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We have time for two quick questions. <laughs> yes, sure, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> It was the same question. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so this is a vase, um, again, from a, a peasant vase, so from the 4th century BC. Um, and I thought this is a very clear case of offensive humor, because what we see here, and there are two vases which belong to the same group. And interestingly, they all come from very different places. So we've got one from Boeotia and one from Athens, if I'm not mistaken, and from different time frames. So from the 5th to the 4th century BC, uh, which basically display this mythical burlesque that was quite prevalent probably in South Italy in the 4th century. Uh, so they took up familiar tragic stories and myths and they, well, they, they, they made a comedy out of it. And here, what we have, it's not very clear, uh, but you can see by the grotesqueness of the mask that this is supposed to be a comic um, performance. Um, so we've got, this is Ajax, this is Cassandra. So this has nothing to do with madness of Ajax, sorry, this, this must be confusing because I mentioned Ajax for his madness, but this has to do with the story of how uh, Ajax raped Cassandra. Uh, so basically here the the, the positions are reversed. So what happens is that Cassandra is chasing after Ajax to rape him. 
uh, and you can see how she's uh, clutching him by the hair and how he's grasping, um, this is the statue of Athena, so how he's grasping the idolon. And then you've got one of, uh, this would be a priestess, yeah, Ieria in the inscription, who is holding a, a key to the temple. And I like the suggestion by one scholar who said that this could be used as a tool to sodomize Ajax further. <laughs> well, this might be a little bit of, um, of a stretch, but. Uh, so basically here you've got the opposite of the story. And again, um, it just makes us wonder why would people funny, uh, find funny something like that? Uh, or again, if, if women saw that vase, how would they react? Would they think it was also funny uh, or, or not? Um, or could it be also seen as a sort of, again, this is taking a bit far, but as a sort of uh, case of female empowerment because, you know, uh, vengeance is enacted upon Ajax and he finally meets his fitting punishment. Um, but it is clearly supposed to be comic. And we've got two other vases which belong to the same group um, and they're not that graphic. So here we see her chasing him. And it's really interesting if you compare it to um, tragic uh, enactments of, um, uh, of the same scene. So where Ajax is running after Cassandra and she's doing exactly what he's doing there. So she's basically grasping uh, the statue. So it's a complete reversal of the roles. So in the other two examples, uh, it's just Ajax running after Cassandra in the one and they all were just very grotesque masks and they're portrayed in this comic grotesque way, but nothing as graphic as this one. Um, yeah, and I think it's a really interesting example. Fortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, let's thank the for a fascinating talk. Thank you.